So most welcome, good evening. And this is a very interesting subject, today's subject, Atharva Veda. That's because the Atharva Veda Samkhida, it's, it's not very commonly studied or taught with the same reverence and respect that you attach to Rig Veda, Yajur Veda and uh, Sama Veda. So this is a very interesting subject because uh, the Samhita portions, the Sukta portions, what you call the hymns used in this particular Vedas are also used or there are mantras and verses which are used for materialistic purposes, for treatment of diseases and you get a picture of the society that was uh, that was prevalent in ancient times. Some of the mantiki, some of the mantras are used or have been used in ancient times for black magic, what we call necromancy, for talking to dead spirits, for doing harm to enemies and also for treating diseases. So, uh, many of the principles of modern Indian school of medicine, Ayurveda, can be found, can be traced to Atharva Veda. That's why, you know, when we talk about Vedas, we use the word Trai. Trai means triple, the three Vedas. So, Atharva Veda was excluded from the group of Vedic studies, it was not considered to be very imp important by the elite Brahminical Vedic society. Because the mantras and verses in this particular Vedas were used for uh, purposes which were not good for society. But of course, remember, we should not be under the wrong impression that Atharva Veda is exclusively a book on these subjects. In fact, three very important Upanishads belong to Atharva Veda tradition. Prasna Upanishad, Munduva Upanishad and Mandukya Upanishad. <laughs> of which Mandukya Upanishad is one of the most profound one of the most abstract philosophical works known to mankind. So that should be kept in mind. So also Muntaka Upanishad. Dva Suparna Savija Sakhaya Samanam Briksham Parishusha Jadi Tayor Anya Pippalam Swadati Anasnan Anya Abhichaka Siddhi. You find the Muntaka Upanishad. It's actually an Upanishad that belongs to Atharva Veda tradition. It is one of the most sublime imageries from a philosophical and spiritual perspective. One of the most sublime imageries ever to be found in any world literature or religious or secular mystical literature. See, the one tree and two branches, one above, the other below. There is a bird sitting on both of these branches they are similar in shape, in size, in color and look. It's same, almost identical. The Suparna, Sayuja, Sakhaya, they are friends also. They are brothers, they are born to this, maybe to the same parents. They are friends, they are alike, they are identical. But they are sitting on two branches, one above, the other below. And now the imagery begins. The bird sitting on the branch below is busy eating fruits of the tree. And sometimes it eats bitter fruits, it becomes unhappy. And sometimes it eats sweet fruits, it becomes very, very happy, overjoyed. And then slowly it moves upward, climbing uh, to reach the top branch 
and as he reaches the top branch of the tree, where the other bird is sitting, which is calm and quiet, perfectly tranquil and peaceful, without e without endeavoring to eat any fruit, so it is always happy. And when the bird that is sitting below, enjoying and suffering, eating bitter fruits and sweet fruits, when he reaches the branch above, and when he reaches close to the other bird, suddenly it realizes, well, we are not two different birds, we are the same bird. Now, the bird sitting below, eating sweet fruits and bitter fruits, suffering, enjoying, again suffering, again enjoying, that bird is a representative, is a reflection of the ordinary human beings living in this world. We are suffering, we are enjoying, we are suffering again. And the bird sitting above, it reflects God, Ishara. And the effort corresponding to the climbing of the bird from lower branch to the upper branch, it corresponds to our spiritual disciplines, our efforts, our spiritual endeavor, spiritual practices, meditation and so on, prayers and so on. Through these practices, when we realize the presence of God within our hearts, then we realize we are actually the same because when we realize the presence of the divine within us, then we realize our spiritual identity. Now, such sublime verses are found in the Mundaka Upanishad. Remember, many of the mantras and verses found in the Atharva Veda, especially those verses which are highly philosophical and spiritually mystical are actually taken from Rigveda Samhita itself. So then, uh, this is Muntagopanishad, Upanishad, then Mantukya Upanishad. It is one of the most abstract and one of the most philosophical and one of the mo most mystical and again one of the most psychological work ever found in any religious tradition. And in fact, I am right now give, giving a series of classes on Mantukya Upanishad which Shankaracharya's commentary in Sanskrit, which is a super commentary by Anandagiri on Shankaracharya's commentary. And every Thursday, I am giving these classes to uh, a good number of uh, monks in India and a few of our own devotees in America are attending it. One of the most classical and one of the most celebrated philosophical uh, parts of Vedic literature. It is found in the Adharva Veda. But still, because there are many mantras in Adharva Veda, which I am going to read, you will be surprised and maybe shocked a bit for us. There are mantras that deal with Ayurveda, how the ancient Indian sages developed certain methods through herbal medicine to treat different diseases, all are found in the Adharva Veda tradition. So, the, the Atharva Veda derives its name from a sage with the name Atharvan. So, it got the name Atharva Veda. And the Samhita portion uh, of, the Supani, of the Vedas are mostly in prose. And just there are a few verses. See, Mundaka Upanishad is uh, in, in verses and Mandukya Upanishad largely in prose. Uh, there are many hymns, and some of the hymns that are very sublime, Prithvi Suttam, where Prithvi, the earth itself, is invoked, is addressed at the divine feminine principle, the embodiment of Kshama, what we call em endurance, forbearance. And uh, Asivamiya Suktam is found in Rig Veda and other Vedas are also found in the Atharva Veda tradition. Now we will just give an outline, then I shall 
read some of the mantras from the Atharvaveda, Samkhida portion, means suktas. <laughs> now, the general principle, you know, every Veda mantra, every uh, word symbol, Veda mantra, has got a Rishi, a Chandas, and a Devada. Rishi is the sage to whom these mantras were revealed in his meditation. Chanda is a, the metrical form, you know. Vedic prosody uh, was very extensive. There are number of meters. See Gayatri, Anushtub, Ushnik, uh, all these are some of the Vedic uh, uh, meters, 24 letters which constitute Gayatri. Is also the name of the divine, divine feminine principle, which is the embodiment of knowledge, truth, memory, and spiritual enlightenment. So it is also the name of a meter. Then Devada, I mean different deities, different divine principles, different deities to whom this uh, uh, mantra is addressed. So, as I mentioned in the last sessions, there are four uh, priests, that is, for Rigveda Samhita, Rigveda tradition is represented by Hota, who actually invokes different deities chanting the mantras from Rigveda Samhita. Then, Yajurveda, Atharyu, is the priest. He is the one who prepares all items for Vedic rites, yajnas and yagas, and the mantras are also in, included in the, in the Yajurveda. Samaveda is the representative of Samaveda tradition. Udgata is the name of the priest, means he chants his Samaveda mantras very loudly, as I explained in my previous class, Samaveda class, you know. It is, it is it is very close to music and is supposed to be the genesis of in Indian schools of music, both the South, Southern tradition and also Northern tradition. We call Hindustani music and also what we call the Southern school of music. With uh, Saptaswaras are all I explained in, the, in my class on Samavedas. So the fundamental principles of music can be found in the uh, Samavedic tradition. Then Atharva Veda, the representative priest is Brahman, it is called. He should be familiar with all the other Ved three Vedas also and he presides over the uh, Vedic tradition. That's why one of our great uh, uh, Vedic scholars and the one who wrote a well-known book on Vedic etymology, it uh, reads more like a thesaurus, though it's considered to be the first attempt to write some kind of a lexicography, you know. It's some kind of dictionary and thesaurus and uh, a book on etymology all rolled into one. It's called, it's called Niruptam, the name of the book, Vedic etymology, and its author was Yaska, who wrote this particular work. On 9th century BC, that is long after Atharva Veda was, had become popular, maybe several centuries, maybe one or two millennia later, Yaska wrote his well known book on etymology called Niruptam. So he says, Sashakrita Dharmana Rushayu Prabhuvu Te Asakshakrita Dharma Bhya Ubadeshaya Gladayanda Mantran Samprapu. What it means is the Vedic sages who realized, who internalized the spiritual truth through their meditation and spiritual disciplines. They wrote down these mantras, Vedic mantras, for the benefit of their successors who may not have realized the spiritual truth of the Vedic mantras in their own life, but in order to help them to practice meditation on the Vedic mantras and then eventually to realize the truth, they wrote down these Vedic mantras. Now, the drashta, you know, every Veda has got a, a, a one prominent uh, uh, called Rishi tradition is called. 
So the drashta, he called drashta, mantra drashta raha rishayaka. I mean, rishi is sage who represents one Vedic tradition, like Atharva Veda tradition. His name was Angiras. No, no, sorry. His name is Angiras, but uh, uh, he was also known as Atharvan. Atharvan, Atharvangiras. Two names are found in the traditional Vedic traditions. Called. Like, for example, Rigveda, Agni is the Rishi. Uh, Yajurveda, Aditya is the Rishi. Samaveda, Vayu, and Atharvaveda, Angira. This is the tradition. Now, uh, there are 20 khandas, 20 sections. I will explain in course of time how many uh, mantras and how many sections are there. I shall try to explain. Altogether, there are 6,077 mantras, means verses. 6,077 mantras. And uh, altogether, 736 Sukta. So, a Sukta contains a number of mantras, a number of verses. So, mantra is the smallest unit. A number of mantras can be found in one Sukta. A Sukta uh, corresponds to what we call in English hymn. So, in a, in a hymn, there may be any number of verses. So, altogether there are 736 hymns of suktas and altogether in all the suktas together there are, there are 6077 mantras and they are classified under 20 khandas or sections and these again are more much more generally classified into prapathakas total four prapathakas this is only for those of you who can study later. You know. So, four Prapathagas divided into 20 Khandas, again divided into 736 Suktas or hymns, that's again divided into 6077 mantras or verses. This is the structure of Atharva Veda Sam Samhita. Now, Atharva Veda Samhita, sorry, yeah, yeah, Atharva Veda Samhita. There are no Aryan Nagas associated with, uh, with uh, Atharva Veda. Only Samhita and three Upanishads and one Brahmana. No Aryan Naga. Normally, you know, for every Veda, there will be Samhita, Aryan Naga, Brahmana and Upanishad. In the Atharva Veda tradition, there is no Aryan Naga so far discovered. We have not discovered any Aryan Naga. But there is one Brahmana, it's called Gopatha Brahmana. And three Upanishads, as I mentioned, Prasna Upanishad, Mundaka Upanishad and Mandukya Upanishad. So our discussion mostly will be about the Samhita portion. That's be our uh, discussion. Uh, so in a general way we can say the Atharva Veda Samhita deals with the stagecraft. There are also very interesting statements about how a king should rule his country, how an householder should look after his family, and uh, there are there are also uh, interesting discussions on matrimony relationship, uh, dharma, artha, kama, and moksha. I mean the principles of ethics and morality. And the methods to be employed for an average, for an ordinary person to acquire his means for livelihood and for fulfilling his worldly needs and demands. And also there are higher ideas as we already discussed, quoting Muntuka Upanishad, the highest spiritual truths are also discussed in a very profound manner in all the three important Upanishads of Atharvaveda tradition. Prasna Upanishad, uh, Munduga Upanishad and Mandukya Upanishad. So this again, uh, sometimes this is called Kshatra Veda. Kshatra Veda in the sense, you know, uh, sometimes there are ideas and teachings related to stage, stagecraft. Kshatra means 
something related to king or kshatriyas with the ruling class i mean there were four groups of people for what we now call castes but the real word used in sanskrit was varna which is not the same as we understand by the english word caste is totally different varna means the aptitude it means color so the temperament the person may be interested in meditation and contemplation he be called a brahmana somebody who is interested in stage craft or maybe in ruling a country or maybe defending a country uh, a soldier's profession he may be called a kshatriya somebody who is interested in business and industry trade may be called uh, vaishyas and those who are interested in doing only service not much philosophical not given to much philosophical uh, discussions will be called shudra so it's called four varnas chaturvarnyam which later degenerated into some kind of a rigid uh, system i mean a, a system of so uh, sociological uh, classification based on temperament qualifications and uh, division of labor later came to be uh, a rigid inflexible social structure called casteism but uh, that degeneration took place over a period of maybe several centuries so it's called kshatra veda because atharva veda deals with uh, uh, subjects related to martial arts fighting techniques different weapons are discussed and how soldiers should be trained in the use of different weapons like sword you know spear and bow and arrow all these ancient sciences Uh, of the vedic areas we are discussed so it's called kshatra veda and again as i mentioned earlier it is the genesis of ayurveda indian school of medicine so it is called bhaisajya veda bhaisajya uh, bishagwara is a person who practices medicine is a doctor may be called bishagwara so bhaisajya is the science of treating diseases and illnesses so it's called bhaisajya veda the vedas that part, that veda which deals with medicine or that veda de- that deals with stage craft and martial arts and things like that so this is a general discussion what i have given here the sages uh, associated with this with atharva veda bhrugu ankhira atharvan etc so as i mentioned earlier atharva veda was not admitted not accepted as one of the uh, well known elite vedic tradition and in some societies in some communities there was um, uh, the, the the practice of looking upon somebody who specializes on atharva veda as somewhat inferior to those who specialize on sama veda yajur veda and, and uh, rig veda that's because uh, this particular veda deals with uh, material sciences uh, gives a lot of importance to medicine stage craft uh, and also as i mentioned earlier uh, necromancy and black magic but those subjects are not given too much importance it shows that once upon a time in ancient vedic society there were a lot of superstitions and a uh, lot of uh, ritualistic practices associated with these superstitions so now let us look at uh, look at the different uh, uh, different sections of this uh, uh, atharveda samhita so the suktas are divided like this vaishajya suktas hymns dealing with medicine treatment of diseases etc ayushya sukta suktas which contain verses that deal with the methods of enhancing your life span health there are wonderful ideas uh, in the in the bhaisajya sukta for example let us say i'm just giving an example suppose a food that you eat 
Uh, it's important that you should be hygienic, otherwise you fall sick. But uh, 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 the other way, the tradition, the Vedic tradition in general tells you, the food that you eat should be served and cooked by a person whose mind is uh, uh, working properly. His mind is full of somebody whose mind is calm and quiet and sattvic and free from disturbances and uh, uh, problems. You know. If a person whose mind is disturbed, if he cooks the food, that food gets disturbed or affected. Now, it is called the sukshma, the subtle connection between what we eat and the mind of the person who cooks that food or the mind of the person who serves that food. You know, such ideas are you find. So, again, another uh, uh, section of the sutta is called the Paustika sutta, in dealing with the welfare. I mean, social welfare, individual welfare, etc. Then, Abhijara Suktas. That's again, uh, rituals, rites and rituals associated with, uh, uh, with people who were fighting and quarreling among themselves. Certain mantras can be chanted that will cause harm to others. Maybe pure superstition, but you have to remember, we are talking about a society, we are talking about... Uh, 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 literature that evolved much before the civilizations of uh, Greece or China or Egypt or Assyria or Babylon or Aztec, Mayan or Incan. I mean, we are talking about Sumerian or either Hellenic or Hebraic civilizations. So remember, we are talking about a very ancient uh, social structure. So they had these beliefs. This belief that uh, if you can uh, invoke certain deities, you can do harm to your enemies, or you can get protection from uh, from some gods and goddesses against evil persons. So all these are called Abhijara Suttas. The Prashtita Suttas mean expiatory rites, penance. If you suppose you forget to perform certain rituals, certain practices, uh, then it's a mistake, uh, it's a uh, omission of uh, error of omission, error of commission. You know, you may forget to do something that you should have done, or you may do certain things that you should not have done. So an act of commission or act of omission. For that you should do some penance. So how to do this penance, how to perform these rites? All these are explained here. And you find sometimes, uh, you know, uh, the Vedic society had this belief that diseases are caused by germs, violation of laws, anger of deities and malevolent spirit. There are spirits. So, they are responsible for this. So, in order to get protection from them, you should perform certain rituals. And if you um, uh, omit certain, uh, omit the performance of certain rituals, uh, then that will cause the ang that will cause some deities to become angry with you. So, you should do prize chitta, it means exp expiatory uh, rites or penance, actual penance. Then they call it karma suktas. This is related to matrimonial or relationship and so on. Then Daja karma suktas, dealing with stagecraft. I mean, this section gives an account of the political system. The king used to be elected by the people, and then uh, prayers used to be offered the time of coronation of a king, the, the rule of a country, and so on. So, and there are also spe special rituals and rites performed at different stages in the uh, uh, according to the uh, growth of a prince who is going to be the next king. This is called Brahmanya Suktas, highly philosophical, highly spiritual, highly mystical, philosophical, Brahmanya Suktas they find. So, and then there were... Uh, so these are the these are what may be called altogether eight sections uh, into which the suktas can be divided. 
and uh, the you can as i'm going to read some verses uh, especially dealing with uh, ayurveda idea i mean the, the ideas of indian medicine uh, instructions from the ayurveda uh, text you will find that uh, you get a picture of the social life and with geographical classification of ancient vedic society so you find the names of places mentioned in gandhara especially kandaha today's afghanistan so it is important cradle of vedic culture magadha today's uh, bihar state angadesha it's also bihar state so you 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 hear about powerful dynasties powerful priests uh, who used to uh ruled the country who is to guide these uh, kings and rulers and all that after this it may be more interesting instead of giving a very just a theoretical picture i shall try to read uh, from the atharva veda samhita itsa so that you get a direct picture of vedic society uh, and their belief and their rituals and their practices so atharva veda sometimes was considered to be the origin of ayurveda as i mentioned atharva vedu veda soyam idi bheshajam nigade idi find yajyam rumo yajmana ruja samani bheshaja yajumshi bheshajam va atharvani so tandi brahmana is actually from sama veda tradition so you find there were many statements in in the vedic literature not only in the atharva veda but elsewhere which refers to atharva veda as the as the origin of uh, ideas related to ayurveda in indian tradition and also the great teachers what do you call acharya the great teachers of ayurvedic tradition like you know charaka susruta vagbhada they all consider atharva veda as the most important one because for them atharva veda is the central Uh, canon uh, for their ayurvedic profession ik khalu ayurvedu nama upangam atharva vedasya charaka samkhita sutra sthanam is find here now there are also very interesting uh, ideas about who is the real doctor definition of an ideal doctor uh, is a great interesting a great inter- is matter of great interest because it comes from a very very ancient text you have to remember maybe around 3000 bc it's a, it's a find this is viprasa uchyade bishak rakshokami va chatana means what it means is the person the sattvic person vipra means somebody who is learned in the vedas called brahmana somebody is familiar with vedic tradition now who is he his bishak is the real uh is a real doctor he is the one who can protect the patients from diseases and also from the causes of those diseases shatam hyasya bishaja sagasramada virutha shatam ya bheshajani shatam te rajan bishaja sagasramurvi gebhira what it says is there used to be a large number of Uh, doctors and a large number of uh, medicinal plants thousands of medicinal plants and hundreds of doctors familiar with this medical tradition and it says that it is a, it is a doc it is the duty of a doctor to bring herbal medicine uh from anywhere in the world for example a particular kind of herbal medicine uh it it should be brought from wherever it is available so adharva uh, veda it mentions in the fifth uh, section you find gandhari bhyo mujavad bhyo ange bhyo magade dhip magade bhyaga praishin janami va sevadhim tak manam paridatmasi i mean for treating a dis- disease a patient 
you can go to gandhara desha angadesha and magadha desha wherever this medicine is available you should uh, bring them and you should not hesitate to get the best medicine wherever it is found so you find such ideas here again who is a real household so as a man you call the price 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 of the means welfare what are the important uh, disciplines values that an householder should have you find prada pada grihapadinno agni sayam sayam saumanasya dada vasor vasor vasudana edhin dhanastva satam hima ruthema so in those days householders used to practice this perform the gahapatti agni in the morning and the evening you know there will be one fire kept gahapatti agni and that fire will be kept alive till the person dies so the fire in which a person performs his vedic rituals the fire from which he kindles the lamp the fire that in the presence of which he should perform his marriage ceremony and the fire which again he should be he should worship in the morning and evening from that fire he should lit the lamp with list the funeral pyre so you can find fire or agni played a very important role in the life of ancient vedic sages so that's why frequently many uh, sociologists and historians find uh, the uh, find the origin of the ancient persian civilization we call the sarastian civilization it is based on fire worship if the many historians find a, a trace of that tradition into the four vedas so an householder's duty main duty was to protect the fire so you don't hear much about a huge temple or elaborate rituals performed in temples like puja you know abhishega that be that developed during the course of later centuries you don't hear about those things in the in these vedic text but you hear a lot about worshiping the fire so that's why you know pratah pradar grihapati grihapati means a householder no agni sayam sayam saumanasya dada so this agni saumanasya dada means somebody this agni this this fire the fire the deity fire which gives prosperity and welfare and wealth to the householder that agni the fire should be worshiped and invoked sayam sayam means during the two junction uh, two junctions of time when uh, night turns to day in the morning and then day turns to night in the evening the fire should be practiced fire should be invoked and worshiped so these are some of these uh, some of these the tradition so also you find the 16 sacraments which are common to hindu society beginning with some of the sacraments before the birth of a person the many sacraments after the birth like uh, you know eating first first, first vanna prasanam it means namakaranam giving a name eating food for the first time the the sacred ceremony upanayana then initiation to gayatri the beginning of vedic studies marriage and dst the last one there are 16 sacraments so you find all these indicated in the atharva veda now uh, interestingly as i mentioned earlier there were also many superstitions you can find this belief in some kind of a unseen invisible evil forces which are responsible for diseases failures misfortunes you can find the traces of those 
ಐಡಿಯಾಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಬಿಲೀವ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಅಥರ್ವ ವೇದ ಯೇ ದಿವ ಪಿದೃಶುಕ್ ಪ್ರವಿಷ್ಟ ಜ್ಞಾತಿಮುಖ ಆಕುದಾಸರಂತಿ ಪರಾಪುರೋ ನಿಭುರೋ ಯೇ ಭರಂದ್ಯ ಅಗ್ನಿಷ್ಠಾನಮಸ್ಮಾತ್ ಪ್ರಥಮಾದಿ ಯಜ್ಞಾತ್ ಸೊ ದೀಸ್ ಡಿಮಂಡ್ಸ್ ಡಿಮಂಡ್ಸ್ ವಿಲ್ ಕಮ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಎ ಫಾದರ್ ಗ್ರ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಫಾದರ್ ಆರ್ ಸಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಯುವರ್ ಆನ್ಸೆಸ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಿಲ್ ಕಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಮಿಸ್ಲೀಡ್ ಯು will create obstacles to your uh, normal life all these beliefs were very uh, very very co- very 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 much widespread among the society during this time of course you know in modern times especially the western indologists and sociologists they have tried to uh, analyze and explain the reason why many of these the many of these ideas are found in the atharva veda which are not found in the sama veda yajur veda or uh, rig veda the reason is the reason could be that atharva veda is of later origin at least many sections of atharva veda mantras and they were probably uh, based on the beliefs and superstitions prevailing among people who are outside the elite group of vedic society uh, there was a lot of uh, you know bifurcation there were social barriers which uh, made vedic culture it is this more sublime aspect of vedic culture very very exclusive and a special uh, privilege of uh, smaller sections of society brahmana kshatriyas mostly so that could be the reason why those who were uh, those who had no access to the higher philosophical ideas like bhrigadarnega or chandogya upanishads even the samaveda chandogya bhrigadarnega is shukla yajurveda those who had no access to had no access to this higher spiritual ideas they continued their belief in this uh, in the superstitions mostly mostly this is common in among many of the uh, ancient civilizations so they believe satam te darbha varmani sagastram viryani te tasmai vishvetam deva jirase bhartava atu so they believed that this evil forces will enter human body and they will create problems so you find exorcism you know you can find this even during the med- medieval times many christian mystics uh, were accused of uh, um, you know having secret contact with satan and devil and so on. all these superstitions were very common during the medieval times in europe throughout europe and there were a lot of inquisitions a lot of genocide and lot of injustices took place now you can find some of these superstitions prevailing in vedic society which is is much more much more ancient so you find for example this can be so the satam te darbha varmani sagastram viryani te so the darbha mani some kind of a, um, a sanctified uh, may be some kind of a protecting uh, element which be we tie people used to tie certain uh, amulets made of different uh, metals you know so they they believed in this sort of things and they these uh, amulets could give protection from diseases and also from evil spirits you find and they also used to perform uh, vedic rites offering uh, havis uh, on fire so the sagassa kshena satavirena satayusha kavishas harshamenam indro yathainam sarado nayati di vishwasya duridasya param so i am offering this um, sanctified clarified butter on the fire invoking a, a divine principle like indra varuna or agni and let this 
uh, Indra, this deity, give, give me protection, long life, and protect me from uh, diseases and death. So, such practices were very common among the Vedic uh, societies, you find. <coughs> Remember, when we talk about Upanishads, the three Upanishads that belong to Atharva Veda tradition are given the same status as the Upanishads of Rigvedic tradition uh, or uh, Yajurvedic tradition or Samaveda tradition. But Atharva Veda Samhita was considered to be uh, outside this conception of three, the three important Vedas. So a person who uh, studies, making a lot of personal sacrifices, undergoing uh, austerities, even uh, ignoring, even neglecting his own material, material requirements, uh, material pleasures, such a person who teaches called, he was considered to be a god living in this world. So it's again, it's a hyperbolic and a metaphor. So Brahmana eva pati na rajanyo na vaishya. Atharveda itself says, those who uh, study and teach and preserve the Vedas, even at the cost of uh, their own material comforts, undergoing uh, a lot of austerities, they were considered to be the, the spiritual protectors of society. So, Adhyabhanam, Adhyanam, Yajanam, Yajanam, Tatha, Dhanam, Pradigraham, Chaiva, Brahmananam, Akalpayed. So, Manu, it comes from Manu. Manu is considered to be the most prominent among the lawgivers. Manu wrote this uh, Manu Smriti at a much later date. So, it comes much later. But, uh, well, who should be an ideal person? An ideal person should be somebody who teaches the Vedas, Rig Veda, Yaju Veda, and Atharva Veda, and also the Upanishadic portion of Atharva Veda, like that is Prasna Upanishad, Mundaka Upanishad, Mandukya Upanishad. He studies this, he teaches, and he preserves and protects this. So, Adhyabhanam, Adhyanam, Adhyabhanam means teaching, Adhyanam means studying, Yajanam, Yajanam, Tatha. He should practice the Vedic rites, Vedic rituals. Uh, so, that such a person was highly respected. So that you can get a picture of the, the concept of Vedic society, what we call the Vedic elite from this particular mantra. At the same time, there were a war sections of society, group, big section of society, who did not care to study the Upanishads, the Rig Veda, Yajur Veda or Samaveda, who were more concerned with these, you know, these, uh, the other rites prescribed in the Atharvaveda tradition, they were considered to be uh, outside the elite section of Vedic society. It's ancient times. So you can find a lot of uh, um, bifurcation in ancient Vedic society. But when we look at the, the picture of Vedic society from our perspective, we should remember that we are, uh, we are talking about a society that lived uh, several centuries before the emergence of Greek, Roman, Chinese, Egyptian, Babylonian or Assyrian civilizations. So, uh, a lot of tribalism you will find uh, in this, especially in the Atharvaveda Samhitas. Tribalism means uh, this concept of mutual warfare and uh, fighting with the enemies and trying to do harm to your enemies, all these uh, ideas you find. That's because uh, uh, there was sort of tribalism among the sections of society. 
So, but along with that, you can also find the sublime heights of mysticism, philosophy, and spirituality. In the Atharvaveda Samhita itself, there are many wonderful ideas, especially the definition of an ideal Brahman I mentioned here. It is a state of spiritual evolution. It is not a position you are born into. It is a state of spiritual evolution if a person becomes contemplative, spiritually oriented, and if he spends his time and energy to study, to teach, to preserve, and to uh, transmit to the next generation the sublime mystical spiritual philosophy of the Vedas and Upanishads, such a person was called a Brahmana. So it went. Thank you, Navil Hai Interaction. You are most welcome to come forward with questions. Thank you. Namaskar. Pranam Maharaj. Yeah, thank you. Namaskar. 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 This is Mark. Yeah. Uh, would it be correct to say that the uh, yeah. Artha Veda is a household ve Veda? Household. Now, as I mentioned, you know, Artha Veda Samkhida, as you said, true. But Artha Veda has got three Upanishads, you know. Uh, Prasna Upanishad. Sorry. Yeah, Prasna Upanishad, Mundaga Upanishad, and Mandukya Upanishad. They're highly. Uh, philosophical. So, uh, of course, you know, Mundaga uh, Upanishad, uh, the, the teacher, uh, the, the student, uh, they're all spiritually elevated persons. So we, we cannot say, but the Atharvaveda Sankhida portions, for example, dealing with uh, uh, Listri karma, paushtya uh, suktas, and certain sections of hymns that deal with uh, uh, the fulfillment of material desires could be uh, considered to be part of the Virgastha tradition, householder tradition. That's true. More meant to uh, people who are living in this world in the midst of all social comparisons and obligations. Yeah. I'd like to read something from an article about this uh, Veda. Yeah. It says it's the, uh, the first mantra. Yeah. And it says, we pray, bless these mantras so they will become fruitful. But without the Guru's grace, they do not work. And if you speak about them too much, they can lose their power. Would you please comment? But that is about mantra. Remember, that particular section deals with mantra. So when, when that say that is it's not the Vedas as a whole. Certain mantras that you repeat silently every day according to certain disciplines under the instruction of a guru or a teacher. Those mantras you are not supposed to discuss or talk about there because that's your own door to your spiritual emancipation. It's not talking about the Vedas in general. So, a guru or a teacher gives you a particular word symbol called a mantra, and that mantra becomes your spiritual, I mean, the uh, your spiritual path to your own mm -hmm. spiritual emancipation. So mm -hmm. that is that is something that uh, you are not supposed to discuss or speak about to anybody. That's what it means. And that you should get from a teacher. Because the teacher <laughs> gives you that mantra and the teacher also transmits to you the ability to preserve it and eventually to realize it. It's, it's not just word that is given. Along with that word symbol uh, the potency, the spiritual potency to realize, eventually to reach your own spiritual destination, repeating the mantra, by repeating the mantra, that spiritual potency is also transmitted by the teacher to the disciple. It is something that we normally do not uh, discuss in a class or anything. Okay? Okay. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. Hari Om Swamiji. Hari. Um, you just mentioned that the Upanishad part of the Atharva Veda has very highly philosophical yeah. content. Then why is it uh, why is it being relegated to the to the status of a materialistic yeah. Veda? Why isn't it given the same importance as the other yeah. Vedas? Yeah. Now, yeah, it's it's more due to the say due to the certain sociological aspects. You know, people who practiced those rites, rituals, uh, especially uh, certain rituals which are uh, called as three karma suktas, you find certain rituals. Uh, they they naturally. They were not of the highest type. Those who were involved in black magic, uh, you know, you can find many mantras in the Rigveda Samhita. Sorry, sorry, Atharva Veda Samhita. I mean, deal with uh, the enemies, how to uh, our prayers to different deities. Uh, my enemies perish. You can find such things surprisingly in the Old Testament. The Old Testament, you can find prayers to Yehovah. Why Jehovah, you know, uh, uh, crushed my enemies? You can find many such uh, prayers. So I think uh, a bit of tribalism uh, can be an explanation for these things. So people who practiced these were not considered to be on the same level, spiritual level, as those who studied the Upanishads or the Samaveda, Rigveda, or uh, that could be the reason. You know. In ancient times, you know, society, the kings and the, the priestcraft, they used to classify the uh, people to different categories based on what they practiced. From now, when you look at it, it's against democracy, against... Uh, uh, we may feel that way, but you should not apply today's uh, principles of democracy and egalitarianism to ancient Vedic societies. Who, I mean, with the, who lived much, much before the uh, other ancient civilizations came into existence? You know? So you should remember. Now, when you look at it, you can see it is totally against democratic principles. You may feel it's totally against egalitarian principles. <laughs> I fully agree with you, but uh, we should not analyze. Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, based on today's principles. So equal rights or human rights or democracy or egalitarianism. That's what <laughs> Okay. Swami, so, there's a very interesting point you bring up over there about yeah. uh, that there might be a sociological reason to yeah. Yeah. Uh, the status of the Atharva Veda. This, this gets me thinking now, is there a relationship between the Chatur Vedas and the Chatur Varnas? Yeah, I no. There is no real connection between Chatur Veda, Chadur Varnim and Chatur Veda. No. Real connection. You, you can find there are many statements which uh, uh, which talk about Rig Veda, Ijur Veda, Sama Veda, and Atharva Veda, the same long line. So mm -hmm. you you won't find that uh, any. Of course, there are a few uh, uh, mantras where Trai is mentioned. Shankaracharya's Bhashya also mentioned Trai. Mm -hmm. That's true. But uh, there are also many statements indicating that Vedas are four in number, which includes Atharva Veda also. Mm -hmm. uh, but may this, this may have happened in course of time, in, the, in later time, in later centuries. You know, keep yeah, I, I, was asking, I was asking because there is this very, very uh, a symmetry between the fact that there are three Vedas which are considered more important than the fourth Veda, just yeah. as how there are three Varnas which are typically considered more important yeah. than the fourth Varna. Yeah, which is why maybe. I no, not in, I don't, I don't think there's any connection uh, like that. No, no yeah. connection. Yeah. The, Atharvaveda, Atharvaveda was not unimportant because Brahman is the representative of Atharvaveda and he is supposed to preside over the uh, whole Yajna Vedic rites and he should be familiar with uh, with the all the four Vedas, and not only that, most of the highly uh, philosophical portions of Atharva Veda Samhita 
appear in Rigveda also. Okay. Yeah, which is more preliminary, you know. Yeah. Thank you, Swami. Thank you. Swamiji? Yeah. This is uh, Mark again. No, no, and uh, no, we've been studying the uh, Bhagavad Gita on Friday night. Yeah. And um, I've been reading it. And um, in chapter 10, it's, it's called the Yoga of Manifestation. Yeah. And Arjuna asked Krishna uh, to explain, let's see, say, uh, please describe the divine self-manifestations which you pervade these worlds and abide in them. And he, uh, Krishna goes to, on to say, uh, yeah. uh, listen, to, I will explain to you my divine manifestations yeah. that are prominent. There's no end to my extent. Yeah. And he talks about uh, different things like trees and snakes. And yeah. when, he when he talks about uh, the Vedas, yeah. he says, of the Vedas, I am the Sama Veda. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Vedanam Sama Vedosmi. Vedanam Sama Vedosmi. Among the Vedas, I am the Sama Veda. Yeah. What, why would he say that and yeah. not another Veda? Yeah, I, actually, I explained this in my lecture on Sama Veda. I shall repeat again. Sama Veda is the sweetest uh, and the most sublime. On the one hand, it contains some of the most profound and sublime philosophical, spiritual ideas, even the Tattumasi Mahavaki, Chandogya Upanishad, Samsama Veda. And also, as I mentioned in my class, you know, Sama Veda is nothing but Rud Mantras uh, tuned to Sappaswara, Trayigrama, uh, like that, you know, that uh, it, called, uh, it, 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 it is called, uh, so, uh, it is nothing but uh, Vedic mantras tuned to the sublime spiritual music. So, uh, that could be the beauty, the charm of Sama Veda is implied here. What Sri, what Sri Krishna is telling is, uh, I am the Vibhuti, called Vibhuti Vistra Yoga, you know. I am the Vibhuti, I am the most sublime, the grandest and the greatest in everything, of everything, in everything. So, uh, here Krishna is not talking about Krishna the personality, the Atman, uh, the Brahman, that all-pervading spiritual divine reality. That, is, that reflects as the most sublime and the most effulgent of everything in everything. Something like I am the Einstein among physicists. Now, if you okay. say that, what it means is uh, you are talking about you are, you are giving a, you are giving an example, and the most wonderful, maybe the the highest that you can think of, uh, the most sublime that you can think of in a particular area of discipline. You know, something like that. So, so I am the most sublime. I am the um, uh, I, I'm, I'm the greatest, the sweetest of everything in that sense. Means uh, it is because it is b because of the reflection of the Atman, the spiritual divine principle in everything that something something really becomes sublime. The, it becomes sublime because it reflects a little bit of that Atman the divine principle. And in proportion to the manifestation of that divine principle, uh, it becomes sublime. So that's the idea behind it. And the Mount Everest among the mountains, so to say. I mean, it is the tallest mountain, something like that. See, like that. So that's the idea behind it. Yeah. Yeah. The Sama Veda is, is then considered the yeah. The highest Veda. Yeah, it is considered. The most sublime. So the most sublime, yeah. That's, okay. that's Thank you. That's, that's why you know Sama Veda is nothing but Rigveda, Rigveda mantras tuned into Swara Mandala. 
Suramantala, I mean into the equal Saptaswara, three grammars, then a twenty-one a tanas, and like that, it's called Suramantala. I mean, it tuned into sublime music. Rigveda, Rigveda mantras are also chanted in a particular tone, no doubt, but it is not as music. That's why Samaveda is considered to be the origin of uh, Indian music, uh, both the South Indian music and also North Indian musical traditions. You can I, you can the Saptaswara, the seven fundamental notes are discussed. So the mean Rigveda mantras turned into seven fundamental notes and different variations of these notes, different possibilities of these notes. That is Samaveda. So the, the, the Udgada, who is the priest representing Samaveda, he sings loudly. That's why it's called Udgada. He sings loudly these mantras according to this Swara Mandala, the musical uh, notation. Then it becomes Sama. Saman itself means Veda mantras tuned into music. Remember, not violent, disturbing music, the sublime <coughs> music. When you listen to the music, you feel a kind of inner fulfillment, inner joy, uh, that brings uh, coitude, tranquility, and peace and sublimity. It takes the mind, it transports the mind to higher thoughts, higher ideas, makes you contemplative, reflective. That kind of music. That's what. It, that's why Swara Mantala is mentioned. It's healing. Yeah, yeah. Extra, spiritual ecstasy, so to speak. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Tatsat Sri Ramakrishna Pranamastu